From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Today, we're going to hear from an expert in the e-commerce and product search space. Nia Hani is the co-founder and COO of CPC Strategy. Nia and CPC Strategy help companies such as Reef Sandals, Invicta Watches, and 7th Generation Cleaning Supplies optimize their performance marketing efforts in Amazon, Google, and Facebook. In our last episode, Nee walked us through an overview of the trends of the e-commerce industry and how he ended up running an e-commerce service business. If you missed that episode, it's very insightful if you're looking to learn about the overall e-commerce space. So I recommend that you go back and give it a listen. That said, in today's episode, Nee is going to walk us through some best practices in the product search industry and explain how his company evaluates their campaigns. Here is the second part of our interview with Nia Honey from CPC Strategy. Nee, welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Glad to be back, Ben. Always good to talk to you. Great to have you here. In our last episode, we went over the general landscape in e-commerce, breaking down sort of the dominance of Amazon for people that know what they're looking for. Google Shopping is for people that are doing their research on specific products. And then there is the rise of the Shopify type carts of the world, which are reaching people on social network in vertically specific ways. I want to dive today into a little bit about how you onboard your clients and what it's like for a company who is looking to start optimizing their online product search. So talk to me a little bit about the onboarding process and what you look for when you're first working with a client. Definitely. So when we first talk to a client, before we actually decide it makes sense for us to work together, the very first thing we want to do is we want to have access to your app account to understand kind of what's gone on in the past, whether you have something set up, whether you're tracking correctly, which is very, very important. A lot of people, especially with Shopify, it's easy to set up that tracking pixel incorrectly. So it's very important that the first thing we do is we understand kind of what's going on. And then we have a conversation with the business owner or the business team to understand what your ROI goals are for the specific channel. For instance, you're in apparel or unbranded apparel, and you tell me you need to be at a 20 to 1 ROI. I'm probably going to tell you that Google Shopping and PPC aren't going to be the best channels for you. Just because we know, generally speaking, in clothing and apparel, the most you'll probably see in terms of ROI at scale is no more than a five to one to a six to one. Likewise, if you're in electronics and you know you need to be at a 10 or a 15 to one, that's realistic given kind of where bids are in the channel. And so that's the first step is really one, assessing the state of the AdWords campaign as is today. And then two, understanding if your ROI goals are achievable based on our experience working over the last 11 years with over 500 clients. So you're essentially looking at your customers and talking to them about what their ROI goals are, and you're looking back against their historical performance in other paid channels to understand what they've been doing. Talk to me a little bit about the bidding strategy. You mentioned that there's ROI multipliers that you're shooting for. Sounds like the key element into maximizing ROI is making sure that you have your bidding strategy dialed in. Definitely. Bidding is something on the shopping side that can be challenging for marketers that are used to keyword or portfolios type bidding. For us as an agency, we found it effective to treat each product as its own business, meaning that we want to evaluate whether that product is getting the traffic it needs to be able to convert. And we have systems and processes in place to be able to programmatically either bid up when things are trending well and bid down when things aren't. So that's an entire process that we've built. We have a ton of white papers that can cover the various different strategies that we leverage to be able to do that. But again, the most important thing and the thing that I want people to take home is that when advertising on Google Shopping, 
you don't want to look at everything at the campaign level. You want to be able to drill in into each specific product and demote your losers and promote your winners. That's the biggest high level overview I can give that will help brands really win on the channel. You mentioned that people that are advertising in Google AdWords are looking at the portfolio level. And essentially what you're saying is there's a collection of products that they're bidding in aggregate, right? Let's use electronics, all of the products that are different types of cords that we're selling, and we're bidding them all the same way, as opposed to the USB versus the USB-C cord have two different bidding strategies. Exactly. So you're essentially placing separate bids for each individual product and you're able to use some sort of machine learning or some sort of algorithm, proprietary technology that you've developed to optimize the bids in real time on a per product basis. Exactly. We're leveraging the past performance of that product over whatever we determine an adequate kind of learning period is to predict the likelihood that maybe a 50 cent click will convert at X rate. And that's how we're able to really work with portfolios. Our largest client has over 5 million products in their data feed. And so that's how we're able to run product level analysis across thousands of not millions of products. And how much do you look at competitor data when you're first starting? Are you trying to establish your initial bids based on similar products? Yeah. So that process, and this is something that Google has done really well, really has developed great tools at, but Google, once you add your data feed and you create your product sets, you're able to take a look at the competitive auction insights to understand where you are in kind of the demand generation curve. So based on kind of where we are, we can make a determination, hey, should we set our default bids at maybe 75 cents or 50 cents based on where we need to be in terms of a traffic level and an ROI level. And then as that data comes in, we can start to allow our software to optimize either up or down based on what the actual performance is. And so, yes, we can absolutely get a sense of how much traffic we're going to get when we initially take over a campaign. But then it's the machine learning that we have or the business roles that we've set in place that then help to take those bids to where they need to go. And how is that strategy different when you think about advertising your products on Amazon as opposed to Google? So Amazon is a keyword driven channel for most advertising opportunities. So the biggest advertising opportunity on platform, so I'm not talking about AMG or AAP for the individuals that are very versed in Amazon. But what are those acronyms? So AAP is Amazon Advertising Program. It's Amazon's programmatic platform that allows you to buy display media off of Amazon. Okay. So that's a very powerful program at the top of the funnel. Essentially, Amazon's retargeting ads. Yep. Retargeting ads as well as leveraging Amazon's first party data. So maybe people who are in market or have browsed the sports category in the last 30 days, you can also leverage Amazon's first party data to drive awareness to either your website or your product listing on Amazon. That's a separate display program. And it's not what I was referring to when I was saying keyword driven. Right. It's their Google Display Network GDN competitor product. Exactly. Got it. For those of you who aren't familiar, Google has AdWords, which is where you buy keywords to advertise in Google search engines. They also have GDN, Google Display Network, which is where you can buy display advertising. So banner ads that are shown on websites across the internet. So most of Amazon is primarily keyword driven with some exceptions. And how is the bidding strategy different between Google and Amazon? When we talk about Google shopping, that's a product driven. So you don't select your actual keywords, Google finds those keywords for you. With Amazon's products, for the most part, now there are some ad products that Amazon has that you don't have to select your own keywords, but for sponsored products, you're selecting different targets, whether you're selecting keywords or you're selecting ASINs or Amazon SKUs to bid against. Those are the products you typically have, or those are the ad options you typically have on Amazon. So it's a difference between bidding on products versus bidding on specific keywords. The irony here is that Google's primary revenue stream is Google AdWords, which is keyword based. But when you're talking about product search, Google has taken the keyword portion out of it and is just looking at your data and deciding what to show and allows you to bid to boost your placement. And Amazon is the one where you have to buy individual keywords for a specific product. Exactly. For headline search, for sponsored products. And those typically for our clients are anywhere from roughly 60 to 80% of the media that we're spending for them. Those keyword driven products on sponsored products and headline search. 
Okay. And you mentioned before looking at the ROI for specific channels, and I think you said the average for retail is five or six to one, and electronics can be 15 to 20. Are there any rules of thumb for what type of products perform better on Google or what types of products perform better on Amazon? That's a tough one. (laughs) (laughs) What I would think about is just the competition on the various different channels. So electronics, part of the reason why you require such a high ROI is the margins in that space are very, very thin because there are maybe two to three dozen major electronics brand manufacturers, Samsung, Apple, LG, there's a few of them. Whereas other categories where there are a ton of different brand manufacturers or contract manufacturers, like say supplement, the ability to drive down that cost and erode margins exists. So that's typically where you're going to see the difference in kind of what performs where or what the ROI requirements are. When it comes to what performs better on each channel, that's challenging. Generally speaking, products convert better on Amazon, but not every consumer searches for every single product on Amazon. For instance, we know for a fact that when it comes to automobiles or motorsports, eBay is a dominant player, more dominant than Google, more dominant than Amazon. Things like electronics, Amazon has completely wiped out the existence of any non-major or regional players. So besides Best Buy and some regional players, you're not going to find Joe's electronicstore.com. So when you're thinking about the different kind of verticals or sub-verticals within retail, it's important to understand one, where consumers are making those searches, two, how competitive the market is, and three, where do you have the ability to actually generate margin to be able to continue to grow your business? Okay. So we've spent a lot of time comparing Amazon and Google and talking about the bidding strategy and the difference in the advertising platforms there. Talk to me about what Facebook's role is in e-commerce. Facebook has three different roles. So the first role is really in that consideration phase or driving consideration. Facebook, for all intent and purpose, is the television, especially for younger generations. And I just want to caveat that when I say Facebook, I also mean Instagram and there are other platforms as well. So stories, any application Facebook owns, with the exception of WhatsApp. But at the end of the day, you're buying ads through the same interface. So whether it's the younger generation with Instagram or the older generations with Facebook, for all intents and purpose, it's a pace where people passively consume content. So interruption marketing, putting your brand in front of consumers in a targeted fashion, That's the first kind of place where Facebook really, really shines. It's basically the pace where people are bored, aren't actively trying to learn or do anything. They're passively consuming content, as you said. So they're open to being interrupted. Absolutely. Being interrupted and being entertained, which is important. So when we work with clients on the retail side, the creative strategy is really about how can we kind of play that mix between being entertaining, engaging, and interrupt somebody. And so your creative strategy on Facebook, especially when you're trying to drive people to your brand for the very first time, absolutely needs to pay mind to those three factors. There's a great example of what I think is a case study for how Facebook is used today. My wife, when she worked at Banana Republic, I think one of the people that she sat next to, it might even have been her boss, started a shorts company called Chubby's. And they are short shorts with very sort of funky, fratty type prints. And they made a lot of content that was about the kind of bro culture, did a ton of Facebook advertising, very targeted towards guys in their mid 20s. And the brand has exploded. And to me, that is one of the best examples I can think of picking out a specific vertical catching people with engaging content to highlight the utility of a product. And then they were able to re-engage people with email marketing and some other channels. But basically, they had guys chugging beers and jumping off of cliffs into pools, wearing their (laughs) shorts, and the frat boys ate it up. And now they have a huge brand. Absolutely. They are definitely one of those digitally native vertical brands that we point to our clients like, look, they've done it. They figured it out. This is what we're trying to do for your niche. You don't necessarily have to frat boys, but you have to understand your customer the same way as Chubby's did. You said digitally native verticalized brand. Define that for me. So these are brands that do not necessarily have physical location. They don't necessarily rely on traditional retail distribution. That means distribution to the Macy's and the Targets and the various different retail outlets of the world. And they're building their entire brand on one, driving consideration through social channels or through influencers. 
And two, something that you highlighted in your Chubby's example, re-engaging that consumer over and over again, whether it's a quarterly basis or monthly basis to continue to drive up repeat purchases. And you see examples of these brands all over the place. Dollar Shave Club with their subscription model is probably the purest example with them with their exit to Unilever about 18 months ago. Chubby's another one. Warby Parker is another one. But they're really focused on kind of grabbing the attention of a specific niche of consumers and then ensuring that there's a reason for them to either spread the word through their great marketing or low cost proposition or value proposition and or repeat by as frequently as possible. Right. So digitally native, meaning they don't have a traditional brick and mortar commerce component. Everything is done online and they don't have a storefront and verticalized brand is they're going after a very specific target market. So with Chubbies, they're going after the frat boy. Dollar Shave Cub was the price sensitive young man. Yep, exactly. I mean, we've had underwear for the last 100 years. It's not like they innovated a new product, but they're going in it and they're reinventing it. And that's the biggest part that these brands are doing so well. Right. Okay. So you mentioned that there were three pillars of Facebook in terms of e-commerce. One of them is supporting digitally native verticalized brands in sort of a browsing capacity. What are the other two? The second piece is really after you get that consumer to your website, being able to retarget them in a place where you know they're spending time. So this is very similar to the first, but it's less so about introducing the product to that specific customer and more so about ensuring that you're staying top of mind because we as consumers are busy, right? The average e-commerce site, 98% of consumers don't actually end up buying after a single session. That's why you have conversion rates of 2%. Add to cart rates are anywhere from 8 to 12% depending on the website. So the question that all brands should be asking themselves is, what are we doing to ensure that the individuals that looked at six different pages, or maybe they actually added to cart, what are you doing to keep that product and similar products in front of the minds of your consumers so that whether they started that session on their phone and then got to the destination, or they started that session at home during the night, they're seeing that product. And so Facebook has an entire suite of products, the cornerstone really being their DPA product, that allows brands to re-merchandise products to those consumers that they have seen and products that are related to those products. And that's the DPA unit that is absolutely a cornerstone of any e-commerce strategy. So essentially two pillars. One, you're finding verticalized user bases. That's kind of the digitally native verticalized advertising. And the second is the ability to retarget customers who have already taken some sort of an action on your web property. And that's the second pillar of Facebook. What's the third? The third is really loyalty and engagement. So given the fact that consumers are spending vast amounts of time on Facebook-owned properties, Instagram stories, Facebook, leveraging not just single-touch email to be able to stay on their radars when you have a new product launch, or maybe it's the holidays and you want to encourage them to come back and buy again. So Facebook allows you to upload your CRM data, whether that's names and addresses or emails and phone numbers, to then find consumers that have purchased from you in the past. And that, again, helps to drive up customer lifetime value because, again, the easiest customer to win is the customer that has already bought from you. So Facebook allows marketers to then market and re-engage customers that have already purchased from them in the past. And again, that kind of rounds out that triangle when you're trying to drive consideration, get people to the website and convert, and then get them to buy again. And so those are three kind of phases that Facebook does extremely well for our retail clients. Makes sense. Essentially, the third pillar is an extension of the second, which is retargeting. But instead of retargeting people that are potentially first time buyers, you're retargeting to your existing customers to stay top of mind and to drive repeat purchases. And you can do that by adding sales or promoting similar products to the ones that they've already purchased. Exactly. Product launches are especially powerful. If you take a look at, I mean, the 80-20 rule is this for all businesses. We've done studies of our clients where the top 10% of customers are responsible for 50 to 60% of clients' revenue. So the most important thing for them is to make sure they know every single product they're launching. So giving them sneak peeks, letting them be the first to buy a particular product. If you know they bought it from you in the past, they're that much more likely to buy whatever you have to offer them. So yeah, it's absolutely a strategy that we leverage. To the top 10% of people who listen to the MarTech podcast, let me just reiterate, I love you all. <laughs> and thank you for sticking with the show. 
Joking aside, uh, tell me a little bit more about the type of customers that CPC strategy serves. Are you going after the early stage startups? Are you going after the big enterprises? Where do you fit into the general landscape in e-commerce? So with 500 clients, we work with everybody from Fortune 100 brands to Shopify websites. What we look for our clients are clients that have established product market fit and are looking for scale. So if you don't have a repeatable sales process, yes, we can have a conversation and point you in the right direction. But the kind of brand that really succeeds with CPC strategy is a brand that already understands what their cost of goods are, understands what the marketing margins need to be, and then just needs somebody to be able to scale out that process and identify new opportunities for amplification. So if that fits you, we absolutely want to talk to you. And talk to me a little bit about your model. Are you looking at a percentage of ad spend or a cost per conversion? How do you structure your relationships with your clients? It definitely varies per channel. So for e-commerce channels, meaning Google or Facebook, where we're driving traffic to our e-commerce website, we're looking at a percentage of spend model. And then for Amazon, we're actually looking for a percentage of revenue model where we're participating in the upside and we're mandating towards a specific ROI goal. Last question for you before I let you go. For the people that are early on in their careers, and the ironic part of me asking you this question is you were like right out of college when we first met, and now you're the COO of a 130-person company. But what advice would you have for you know the knee 10 years ago that's early on in their career to be successful in learning and growing their careers in product search? I would say, and this is for anybody doing anything in digital or online in any way, shape, or fashion, learn SQL. At the end of the day, if you can query whatever database you're working on, I mean, there are a lot of different databases out there, but most are relational databases. If you understand how SQL works and understand how to put different data sets together to be able to drive insights, you're going to be able to be that much more effective as a marketer, that much more valuable toward an organization. And it helps you really drive insights to really understand where there are value. So when I'm interviewing people on my marketing team, when I'm interviewing people to become media buyers, even if they've dabbled in some SQL, that's a skill set. It's a hard talent you have. And it's an asset that's going to differentiate you from any other marketer I'm going to talk to. I think it's great advice. A huge part of marketing and technology is being able to access the right data so you can analyze it. And SQL is obviously a key component to doing that. With that said, anything that we can help you promote, anybody that you're trying to reach, what can we pub for you? So we're doing our second annual Ad Diego. That is a user summit or a marketing summit here in San Diego, California. It's on September 13th. We'll have speakers from CPC Strategy, some outside speakers, maybe one of the big three. I'm not going to hint which one it is, speaking on a day-long session about marketing strategies on Amazon. So we're more than excited to kind of put that out there. And if anybody would be interested in coming down, please reach out to me and we can see what we can do to hook it up with a discount as well. Okay. Add Diego, San Diego, beautiful city, great time of year, September, get some sun, talk a little bit about digital advertising, meet Nia Hani from CPC Strategy, anybody that's interested, it's coming up in September. So with that said, uh, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Nia Hani for joining us. If you're interested in learning more about Nia Hani, CPC Strategy, or Add Diego, go to cpcstrategy.com. If you'd like to read the transcript of this podcast, we've published it on martechpod.com. And if you're a subscriber to the Martech Podcast, mostly if you're our top 10%, I love you. Thank you. We want you to feel like a member of our community. So if you have questions, comments, you'd like to be a guest on the show, there's a contact us form on our website. Again, it's martechpod.com. Or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn or Twitter, Ben J. Shap LLC. That's B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P LLC. If you haven't subscribed yet and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we've got great episodes lined up in the next couple of weeks. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks again to Nee for joining us. And until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.